All right, morning everyone, and uh, welcome to our latest SEBRA webinar, um, or as we call them, SEBRINARS. My name is Richard Kane. I lead the Biosecurity Innovation Legislation and Education Branch in the Biosecurity Strategy and Reform Division of the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Before we begin today, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands on which we meet. Um, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, and for me here in Canberra, this is the Ngunnawal people. Uh, I acknowledge and respect their continuing, continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. And I extend that recognition to the traditional custodians of all other lands on which our staff and participants are gathered here today, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending today's events. Just before we start, just a, a quick bit of housekeeping. I did mention it before, but um, please keep your, your microphones on mute and your cameras off. Um, it's just so that we can focus on the on the presenter. Um, the, you should also have the, the chat option or comment option. So um, at the end, we will have the opportunity for further questions. So if you do need um, or, or have any questions, please um, feel free to start to put them in and we'll moderate them. And, hopefully get to them all um, at, at the end of this webinar. So um, please make sure you do that. Um, just for a quick recap, for those who don't know, uh, the Centre of Excellence for the Biosecurity Risk Analysis, um, or SEBRA, is a long-standing biosecurity research initiative and it plays a vital role in providing the Australian, as well as New Zealand, governments with expert biosecurity risk analysis and advice that helps inform a range of biosecurity risk management activities. The Australian Animal Disease Spread Model is used by animal health authorities in Australia to support disease planning and preparedness. Today's very exciting webinar will feature work undertaken by the SEBRA to develop a new ADIS ASF model to represent the domestic and feral pig populations in Australia and simulate the potential spread and control of African swine fever. To explain more on this topic, it's my pleasure to present today Dr. Richard Bradhurst, who is a Senior Research Fellow at SEBRA. Welcome, Dr. Bradhurst. Um, he specialises in the fusion of multiple modelling approaches, mathematical agent-based, network and cellular automata, to simulate the spread and control of emergency animal disease, plant and environmental pests, as well as human disease. Dr. Bradhurst is the co-creator and principal developer of the Australian Animal Disease Spread, Modelling Framework, the European Transboundary Animal Disease Modelling Framework, and the Australian Plant Pest and Disease Modelling Framework. I think I deserve a, a clap for getting that uh, that all correct. Um, and just a reminder to everyone, before I head over to Dr. Bradhurst, this is being recorded. So if you do um, want to catch up or, or review anything, it'll, it'll be on there. Use the comments fields um, for, for all of your questions. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Bradhurst to get us underway. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And uh, just a sec while I slide show. So hopefully you've got um, audio and visuals there. You should see my um, slide. So it's a, a pleasure to be here. I've been looking forward to presenting the seminar for pushing on for a year now. So, and I, I very much appreciate everyone that has uh, tuned in. Thank you for your interest. I'm going to start uh, by acknowledging my tribe. So rather than waiting to the end, um, it really does take uh, a village to produce an epidemiological model. And uh, this is the village that I'm a part of. Um, I'm going to describe some work that we've done in, in, in a couple of projects. Um, and I've been involved in project work for a long time. This has been one of the most enjoyable and I think effective projects just because we had great engagement at a variety of levels. So we had federal government, state government, uh, private researchers, university researchers, industry, industry bodies. And um, I should also mention that uh, I had a bit of a Doctor Who moment because 10 years ago I was living in Canada uh, writing TCPIP firmware for the military. And uh, next minute, I'm living in Australia thinking about emergency animal disease. And EADs, uh, 
things that have been in the press a little bit lately, in particular foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, lumpy skin disease. So these are transboundary diseases that have the potential for a huge impact in a naive population. The three uh, that I mentioned are exotic to Australia. They're not currently here, but they are in nearby countries. And it's not just an economic impact, um, although it, it can be a huge economic impact. There's also a tremendous social cost and environmental cost uh, if we uh, do experience uh, outbreaks of these diseases in Australia. There's an excellent uh, government resource there that I put the, the link to to read up on emergency animal diseases. So I'm, I'm pitching this talk fairly generally. So uh, if you're not familiar with the area, you can come along for the journey. And if, it, if you are in the space, then uh, you might see something that, that interests you or infuriates you. Happy to, to chat with you about that uh, at the end or, or later on. So just focusing on ASF, it's a contagious hemorrhagic disease that affects domestic and feral pigs. Uh, the strain that we're interested in is the one that's marching uh, through Asia, the Georgian strain, which is uh, highly virulent. Uh, it has quite profound clinical presentation, so fever, uh, loss of balance, mobility, appetite, hemorrhages, abortion, depression. And uh, that strain also has a very high case fatality rate pushing up to the 100% level. So ASF is transmitted uh, through direct contact between animals, nose to nose. Uh, it can go via a third party, such as the environment. Uh, some soft ticks uh, are known to be reservoirs of the virus. Uh, it's uh, quite resilient, so it can uh, remain active, viable uh, in uh, tissue, uh, pork products, feces, etc., for quite a while. And an interesting uh, consequence of that is that if a feral pig uh, does succumb to ASF, uh, its carcass may remain a source of infection for quite a period. And uh, feral pigs are known to interact uh, with carcasses. It may be to scavenge, it may be just attracted to the, um, the odours or you know, insect activity, um, at part decomposition, but they are known to, to visit, interact with them. And um, depending on how quickly the carcass decays, uh, will influence the level of infectious pressure uh, that that carcass may play. So the current thinking is that in Australia, in the top end, a feral pig carcass may have vanished in five, six, seven days. Uh, but in the colder regions of Australia, they might remain uh, for months. So it's an interesting um, facet of, of an outbreak and um, one that we'll talk about a little bit later. So as I mentioned, uh, ASF not yet in Australia, but in neighbouring uh, countries. Uh, we regularly detect uh, DNA of the virus in seized pork products. And the current thinking is that a, a multi-state outbreak uh, poses a, a $2 billion threat. So the question now is what might uh, an EAD outbreak look like when we've not you know, recently had EADs? Uh, we had FMD in 1872, I, I believe. Um, I don't think we've had ASF, but certainly there's no recent experience or knowledge of what these diseases might do in Australia. So it turns out to be quite a complex problem in time and space. Uh, where would they arrive, when, what time of the year, uh, how might they get in? Uh, would they establish uh, the means of transmission? So with ASF, we've mentioned uh, direct contacts, indirect contacts, perhaps tick-borne. Uh, current thinking is that the, the soft ticks that we have in Australia, um, that potentially it could be a vector of the disease, don't actually feed on feral pigs. So you know, there's... there's uh, a little bit unsure about that. Uh, certainly spillover between domestic and feral pigs um, is a potential concern. So once ASF is in, when will we notice it? Um, how will we notice it? What sort of response, um, what policy options are there? What resources will be required? 
uh, how might the lack of resources impact uh, our response? Or if we have multiple incursions of an EAD at the same time? Uh, once we think we've uh, won the battle, uh, what uh, activities occur after? Uh, surveillance, perhaps, or uh, evidence of absence. Now, all of this is happening in an environment um, where there's variability heterogeneity. So production systems, levels of on-farm biosecurity, uh, movements of, animal, of live animals, climate, uh, regionality, seasonality. So it's a complex space, complex problem uh, in time and space. As it turns out, there's a technique called agent-based modeling, which is quite good at uh, breaking down complex problems. So you, hopefully you're getting an animation there of a, a murmuration of starlings. Now it would be very complex to try and simulate that by just looking at the population level, um, waxing and waning three or four dimensions and trying to encapsulate that. It's easier to look at each individual starling, figure out what their rules are, what their motivation is. And uh, it turns out there's relatively simple rules to do with collision avoidance and pack mentality, which enable us to imbue these characteristics into autonomous starlings, and then we just release them and they collide and we get the emergent behavior, which is the murmuration. So that's a philosophy. And we're doing the same thing, tackling our modeling of outbreaks. So if we disaggregate an ASF outbreak, our agents or actors, our herds, farms that may have one or more herds, sale yards and abattoirs, and they're existing in an environment that may be conducive to spread between an infectious herd and a susceptible herd through different pathways. And we have a control environment whereby we're going to notice and deal with the outbreak. So we use the same technique as a murmuration and that we disaggregate the problem. We model 30 or 40 aspects of the space independently on individual threads of execution and then we smash them together, let them collide, and our emergent behavior is an outbreak. So this is the technique we use to develop ADIS, the Australian Animal Disease Spread Model. Um, they, we developed this as a research project uh, from 2012 to 2015, uh, funded by the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, and a very close collaboration um, between myself and the department. So ADIS is a decision support tool. It allows a user to simulate the introduction of the virus into any herd in Australia at any time of year. Simulates spread, detection, response, and post-outbreak management. So back to our ASF problem and our disaggregation of the, of the, uh, the problem space. So our units of interest, um, which we can call agents, other herds, sale yards, and abattoirs in Australia. We define a herd as a group of co-mingling animals under the same production system. So the, the fine print there is that we're saying they share a contact network. So if we have a group of animals that are housed, uh, living together, we're saying that they're well mixed and homogenous from the point of view of disease transmission. Now, an agent has static attributes and dynamic attributes. So examples of static attributes is where the herd is, uh, maybe the number of sows, the type of production, number of sheds, uh, the level of on-farm biosecurity. And the dynamic attributes is infection state and disease state and control state. So we model infection and disease separately, and I'll get into that later. So um, as part of the project, we um, analysed uh, APL data from 2021 and came up with a national data set of pig herds. And we've um, grouped them into six categories. First four categories are commercial, uh, and then five and six are non-commercial. So the criteria for the categorization was the number of sows, uh, typical biosecurity, 
typical types of movements off the farm. And um, just to clarify between the difference between small holder and pig keeper is a uh, small holder had one or more registered movements in NILS and uh, pig keepers did not. So uh, pig keepers are sort of the unknown quantity. And we felt that the number of registered pig keepers was underestimating the actual number. So we added 14,000 uh, synthesized pig keepers uh, to our set of 6,000 um, known pig keepers. And we ended up with about 22,000 distinct agents uh, in our model. And that is uh, that's the model to statically displaying uh, all of them. But if I remove the pig keepers, we get perhaps a clear idea um, of where the registered, or uh, well, most of the registered uh, pig herds are. Yeah. The same way that we thought about starlings having autonomy, and a set of rules uh, that dictates their motivation in life. We need to come up with rules as to how a herd, as I said, a naive herd, will react when challenged with a particular virus. So inside each of our 20,000 herd agents, we embed a mathematical submodel. And that takes into account the strain of virus, uh, the type of herd, and the number of sheds uh, uh, comprising the herd. Now, the model is known as a compartmental model, and the compartments uh, are the colored boxes. So S for susceptible, E for exposed, I for infectious, R for recovered, and D for deceased. We're going to ignore the C, because that will just confuse matters for the purpose of this talk. But um, the compartments can hold a quantity of animals, so a proportion of the overall herd can be in each of these compartments at any given point. So to illustrate this mechanism, because it is a cool mechanism, I'm gonna pop four individuals in my S compartment. Uh, you might have to peer closely at your screen, but there's four smiling faces now and they're susceptible and uh, life is good for them. And at some point, those susceptible individuals, one or more are challenged with the virus. So at that point, one of them pops over into the exposed compartment. <coughs> so it could have been that um, someone from overseas in an area uh, where there is ASF um, brought the product back um, and it ended up being fed uh, to the pigs, perhaps as scraps, and uh, as luck may have it, that product was contaminated with ASF and the pig became infected. So at this point, we have three susceptible pigs, one exposed pig. Now, after a period of time, uh, the pig becomes infectious. It's still got a smile on its face, because at this point, it's not presenting clinical disease, but it is infectious. And so its mates start getting in trouble. So now we have two more pigs that are exposed, have been challenged and over time. We now see that our infectious pig is not feeling well at all. So clinical disease is set in there. We've now got the third pig exposed. Another pig's joined the infectious compartment. So the infectious pressure in the herd is built up, but luckily there's no more susceptibles there. And then we've got all four pigs in the infectious compartment. And then very sadly, our first pig has succumbed to the disease. So they're in the deceased compartment next two, and then miraculously one pig made it. So we have a recovered pig in the R compartment and three deceased pigs. So the flow between these compartments is governed by the ordinary differential equations, which we're not going to go into, but we configure or we flavor the equations to dictate the rate of flow, you know, the, the level of danger, pressure that's being exerted inside that herd. Now, don't get too hung up <clears throat> on the equations because we can put whatever set of equations we like inside a herd and it's private to the herd in, in, the, in a software engineering sense. 
So what's exposed to the outside world is the result of those equations. So we solve them numerically, we get curves over time summarizing or projecting what will happen inside that single herd if it's challenged by the virus. So these things are called prevalences. And we, we project the infected prevalence, infectious prevalence, clinical prevalence, recovered prevalence, deceased prevalence, <clears throat> serological prevalence, and um, not relevant in this discussion, but we can also simulate lactoprevalence uh, where we can detect antibodies in milk. So it's these curves that are exported and made visible to the rest of the world in our agent-based model. If we only had one pig herd in Australia, our outbreak would be that set of curves. But of course, we decided that we've got 20,000 agents that may play a role in our outbreak. And so now we think about how we're going to join the dots, and this is our environment. So the first aspect of the environment is nose to nose contact between pigs. So how can an infectious pig come into contact with a susceptible pig? And the obvious one is movements of live animals. So to simulate that, uh, we replay historical movements of animals between farms. So we simulate the exact locations of farms and we simulate precise movements of certain animals between those farms on certain days of the year. Now, indirect contacts are harder to simulate uh, in a mechanistic manner like that. There's much less data on indirect contacts. So contacts sort of generated by trucks, uh, feed delivery trucks perhaps, or AI technicians or veterinarians or visitors to farms, but third parties that will move between farms and potentially convey fomites. So what we do is we just estimate, based on those herd types that we defined, typical level of risk presented by indirect contacts for that production system. And we uh, convey that as a, uh, a probability, daily probability of likelihood of an indirect contact. Now, third mechanism is neighborly spread. So this is mystery spread between neighbors where we're not quite sure how one neighbor infected the other neighbor, um, but it can happen. Uh, it's more prevalent in an airborne disease such as the FMD. But nonetheless, uh, we honor the potential for this sort of transmission in the model. Now, still flavoring our environment, um, <clears throat> the control aspects. So we represent or we simulate, um, first of all, the detection of uh, infection. And then a suite of responses as per OSVET plan. And uh, that includes movement restrictions, so declaration of controlled areas, contact tracing both backwards and forwards off uh, infected premises, active surveillance, uh, stamping out, which is comprised of depopulation, uh, disposal, decontamination. Uh, vaccination is not relevant in our ASF model, it's not currently. Um, a commercial vaccine available, but the mechanism is there. Um, it's just disabled, so we can use that down the road if the vaccine becomes available. And every action, every task that we simulate, we constrain it based on finite pools of resources. So what this means is that we're honouring um, the real life aspects that sometimes there just aren't enough people or trucks or consumables to complete a task. And if that happens, uh, the task, uh, such as a surveillance visit, gets queued and it only gets enacted when a resource becomes available. Now, one of the things about ADIS um, that EpiVets quite like is that we try and um, honour imperfections in life. So the things that go on, which will hinder our effectiveness in dealing with an outbreak. So I've already mentioned, uh, we may run out of resources or have a bottleneck for certain types of resources. Uh, another example would be the reporting of clinical signs that look like ASF, but it's actually not ASF. And the trouble is it's a red herring uh, that results in a surveillance team being sent out to investigate 
but it doesn't yield anything in the greater um, picture of the outbreak. So we, we uh, represent false tracing, you know, tracing inefficiencies, false report and clinical signs. And importantly, um, we have a naughty dial whereby we allow quarantines to be imperfect. So the user can decide uh, how many illegal movements and the, the nature of those illegal movements during the outbreak. So this is um, the model. Now it may be a little choppy because I think the frame rate uh, in Teams is it's not particularly high, but just to highlight a few things, it's obviously a very visual model and you may get the sense that it's repeating over and over again. And the reason for this is that it's a stochastic model. So in this particular scenario, I am dropping infection into a specific pig herd near Kingaroy and letting the model decide as to how it might spread and how we, it might react to our control, our response. So just breaking it down, um, it's a GIS model. So what, what I've uh, highlighted there is a representation, graphical representation of the outbreak. So we can see the network, infection network formed there. Uh, the red arrows is where a susceptible herd has infected, I'm oh, sorry, an infectious herd has infected a susceptible herd through a live animal movement. Uh, the yellow arrow is where an indirect contact has resulted in transmission. Uh, if there were sale yards in play, which there aren't uh, in this particular one, we'd see a brown arrow. Uh, if this disease was an airborne one, which it isn't, we'd see a cyan arrow. And uh, if we have neighborly spread, we'd see little green arrows. So it's representing not only the infection network, uh, but the means of infection uh, between the nodes. Now the colored dots are representations of the control program. So if a premises is identified as uh, having had clinical signs reported, it lights up in a certain color and uh, we dispatch a surveillance team. Similarly, if, if contact tracing has identified a premises of interest, uh, it turns a different color uh, until such time as a surveillance team has been sent out and made a determination uh, as to whether infection is present. You may be able to see some circles. There are controlled areas, uh, restricted areas, controlled area. And um, yeah, that's probably the, the key features there. Now that in a way is our murmuration. So that is our emergent behavior of this particular iteration of the outbreak. The orange curve is the actual infected premises that only the simulation knows about. And then the red curve is the known infected premises, which the disease manager knows about. So if you like, it's a battle between good and evil or between the unknown and the known. And if we get closure resolution on that outbreak, it means that the good guys won and we're able to find and deal with all the infection in the outbreak. That's a epi curve, uh, which epi vets are rather fond of. So that represents the impetus of the outbreak, the number of new cases per day. Uh, this is giving us insight into our resource pools. So do we have enough surveillance teams um, currently or is there an overload, is there a backlog of surveillance tasks? Uh, other resource pools uh, for culling, uh, disposal, decontamination, and we're not using vaccination. This monitor gives an insight into how the depopulation mechanism, disposal and decontamination is faring. Surveillances, surveillance visits are dynamically reprioritized every day based on where infection uh, is being reported. Uh, so this, if you like, simulates the sort of dynamic decisions that uh, might be made in control rooms to where the priorities are for surveillance. Now, this is an important one. I mentioned before, it's a stochastic model. So I've got one scenario here of ASF dropped in a small commercial herd near Kingaroy. And because the model honors the heterogeneity, the variability, the uncertainty, every outbreak attempt is different. So every iteration is a little bit different. What we need to do is run that scenario over and over again. 
maybe a thousand times or five thousand times and we get trends emerging out of that scopasticity so what i've got visualized there in the screen are just two of many outbreak variables um, outcomes i should say the blue histogram is the outbreak duration so right now uh, we've completed 97 out of 100 iterations and our median outbreak uh, length is 82 days, but it ranges from 70 to 103. And our median outbreak size or number of declared infected premises is 17, but it ranges from 8 to 40. So normally we do um, many thousands of iterations and we'd get uh, an idea of what is our most likely uh, outcome for that scenario and what's our best case and worst case. Now, the model, as I mentioned, keeps track of every simulated action. It, it applies a cost. So we get a running cost um, of the control program. Uh, and that enables us to do relative comparisons uh, in cost efficiency between different strategies for control. So that is our ATIS model running that's the asf model and at this point we're only looking at um, asf in domestic pig premises now it begs the question why have we gone to all this trouble so what is the point um, of a complicated model like ADIS? and one aspect is that we can think of a simulation like ADIS, like a flight simulator, in that it's potentially quite expensive and complicated to build. But once you've built it, provided you're a pilot, um, you can do a lot of useful and interesting experiments in the flight simulator. So ADIS is the same in that it's a, a complex tool to build and, and quite complex to use. But if you're an EpiVet, you can pose a lot of very specific and interesting questions about outbreaks without needing someone like me to go in and reformulate the model. So we don't have to redo the mathematics or the statistics or the computer science. Uh, we provide user dials uh, to ask specific questions. So, for example, um, we can play around with uh, early detection, late detection. You know, what is the emergent behavior down the road and the severity and the impact, the damages from an outbreak if we're late to detect? You know, what uh, sort of investments in detection uh, might be worth considering? Um, resourcing is a big one. What, you know, for a disease that we haven't had, um, what resources will be required? Is our policy appropriate? Do we want to experiment with different size controlled areas? Uh, if a vaccine becomes available, should we think about using it in a suppressive ring context? Will we run out of vaccine? Will we run out of resources? Uh, should we target uh, specific um, herd types? And um, illegal movements. So if we set up a quarantine and uh, we've, we've uh, adjusted the naughty dial such that the legal movements get through, uh, what is the impact down the road in the emergent behaviour? to the overall outbreak. So our test case um, back in the day was FMD, and uh, we focused on livestock. Uh, we've since moved to looking at ASF and livestock, but the big question is what about feral pigs? So the first thing to consider uh, is how do we represent the feral pig population? So here our unit of interest are sounders, our agents, and we're saying that they're a familial group with the same contact network in the same way that our domestic herd is the same contact network. Um, we allow the home range of a sounder to vary regionally and seasonally, and we allow the size of the sounder to also vary regionally and seasonally. And uh, similarly to the domestic um, herd, we have infection, disease and control um, states and dynamic sense. So trying to figure out the distribution and abundance, our starting point uh, was a 2008 study uh, by West. And uh, we augmented that with other national and regional studies, uh, incorporated habitat suitability data, permanent water data, land use and vegetation. And uh, we came up with a, 
uh, a reworked estimation of feral pig distribution in abundance. So I've just got the Queensland um, data displayed there, but you can see the high density areas of uh, feral pigs uh, in the north of Queensland. That's where they're four to five uh, per square kilometre. Uh, down through the uh, sort of uh, greeny colour, which is one to two feral pigs per square kilometre, and then the blue is low density of zero to one feral pigs per square kilometre. Now we need uh, to represent um, how these populations change uh, in time and space. So we defined, or we've reused uh, seven previously defined eco-regions uh, across Australia. And uh, we took into account studies on feral pig population dynamics to come up with uh, estimates of how populations in each of these areas might change over time. So we allow the sound of size in the home range to vary by region and season. Uh, the green curve there uh, in the graph is uh, showing the total estimate of population. So currently we're saying it varies between uh, two and a half to three and a half million pigs um, over the course of 12 months. So that's a graphic of the model displaying um, the feral pigs as a monochrome um, uh, key, just purely for visualisation ease, and then the commercial pigs are uh, sites are overlaid over that. This is zoomed in southeast Queensland uh, just to get a, a, an idea of the um, relationship spatially between uh, where we're estimating feral pigs and where the domestic pigs are. Now we use the same uh, mechanism to uh, model the spread of disease within a feral pig sound, the same OD system, but we're interested in the D compartment this time because we discussed previously that there's the chance of uh, feral pig carcasses remaining active, uh, uh, the virus remaining active and contributing to uh, the outbreak. So that will be driven um, by the mortality rate, which is high in the Georgian case, and the carcass decay rate epsilon, which we allow to vary regionally and seasonally. Now we allow uh, sounders to interact based on estimated contact rates between uh, nearby sounders. And we allow those contact rates to vary regionally and seasonally. And then the likelihood of transmission uh, is informed by feral pig density, uh, the home range of the, the two sounders, uh, level of activity, which is seasonal, uh, the amount of virus present, carcass decay rates, and uh, where the sounders are in time and space. Now, the uh, crux of, the, of all this is spillover, so between uh, domestic and feral pigs. And uh, again, it's driven by contact rates, which uh, we estimate, uh, but we're allowed to vary regionally and seasonally. And the likelihood of transmission, again, is, uh, is informed by the level of feral pig um, population, home range, uh, the amount of virus, carcass decay, uh, the spatial proximity between domestic and feral pigs, level of on-farm biosecurity, uh, and again, the context in time and space. Uh, we simulate surveillance and control in feral pigs, so we can do experiments on population thinning, for example, uh, to see what effect that might have uh, on overall outbreaks. And uh, we've used a, uh, some CIRA research um, on uh, trying to get a handle on how difficult uh, it will be to enact control in different parts of Australia. So we've defined a control difficulty index um, which reflects uh, such parameters as uh, terrain ruggedness, proximity to transport, land use and remoteness. So this is uh, some stills of the, the ASF model. I've just captured uh, the model at the end of a particular run. Uh, so this is again dropping ASF into a small commercial near Kingaroy. See that we've controlled uh, the outbreak in the domestics, uh, but we've got a spillover outbreak in the feral pigs. So that's represented with the, the yellow curve. Now, one of the cool things about a model such as this is it's very easy to rethink our assumptions. So what if we've got our estimate of feral pig population wrong? Um, we can just increase it with a dial. We can feed in fresh estimates. And so here I've increased the feral pig population to beyond what we think it is. And interestingly, now we're getting more spillover. 
So we're getting recurrent outbreaks in the domestic uh, population and bigger outbreaks in the feral population. Now this time I've experimented by dialing up my intersounder contact rates. So again, further spillover in the domestics and uh, increased uh, outbreaks in the feral pigs. And then finally, I, uh, in a Machiavellian spirit, I've increased my feral pig population into sound of contact rates and my spillover contact rates to well beyond what we think they are. But now we've triggered a new behaviour whereby we're getting a hint of endemicity. Um, the green blotch that's highlighted there is the, is the fire front, if you like, of where the ASF is burnt through. And you just see a faint glow of orange where it's still active. And the important thing is that we're now getting a stronger um, outbreak and seems to be staying in the in the feral pigs. But again, this is with very generous inputs um, for experimental purposes. So emergent behavior, our murmuration, if you like, um, is also a pub test. So this is what the model is telling us. So if, if we modeled our murmuration and they all smacked into a hill, then that would fail the pub test. So the pub test now is before you, this is the sort of messages that the model is telling us in non-commercial premises, which have low biosecurity, we see more spillover uh, to and from feral pigs, it seems. Uh, non-commercial premises tend to have low stock numbers and limited movements. And the model shows us that there's a tendency for ASF to fade out if it gets into non-commercial premises. So what that means is we're seeing generally a limited role in the greater outbreak um, of non-commercial premises, even though there is uh, you know, increased uh, likelihood of spillover. In the commercial premises, which have generally better biosecurity, we see less spillover to and fro feral pigs. Um, we see limited transmission from commercial to non-commercial. So that's congruent, uh, given that we're replaying NIS historical movements. Uh, we see indirect transmission as a significant drive. That's consistent uh, with experience in Europe. And the, we're currently seeing outbreaks um, per our assumptions, though we've set it up to be controlled within six months in commercial premises. Uh, feral pigs, if we drop ASF different parts of the country and we just let it burn, uh, we see velocity that is consistent with Europe. Uh, in our case, it varies you know, 10 to 25 kilometers a year, but it averages about 20 kilometers a year, is what they actually see. Uh, spillover depends on where you are in the country. So feral pig population density um, and on-farm biosecurity are the key drivers in whether we'll have spillover. Outbreak size and duration depends on the uh, density of pigs spatial proximity, contact rates, carcass decay rates. So these are you know, fairly congruent um, behaviours, I, I would think. And um, outbreaks are likely to fade out in feral pigs within a year if they're controlled in the domestic pigs. So we get heterogeneity. There's no one answer. If someone says, what's ASF going to look like? Will it get into the feral pigs? It depends where and when you are, because you'll get quite different outbreaks. And I think that's one of the key messages is that you do need a, a model that takes this regional seasonal variability heterogeneity into account uh, to pose questions in time and space. Always got to ask why we do this. So the sort of questions that a model can help us with um, help to quantify the importance of on-farm biosecurity because we're, we're simulating every individual premises in Australia that has peaks so we can um, let's just say improve on-farm biosecurity of a certain production system, small commercial perhaps, by a certain percentage. And uh, you know, if we dial that up, how do we fare with the emergent behaviour down the track in the bigger picture? So lots of interesting questions that um, a simulation model like this can help us pose. I'm going to wrap up. I think we're just coming up to the time, but. Um, uh, this is ongoing work, so um, we work very closely with the Department um, of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, so they're tremendous supporters um, of 
simulation modeling uh, for decision support, and they have been for decades. Um, uh, first through the OSPRED model, and then last 10 years through the ATIS model. So uh, interesting new areas that we're looking at is the potential for indirect spread out of abattoir. So that's um, trucks carrying infection um, to uh, or you know, out of the abattoir. Uh, Risk-based control areas. And I just want to mention, we've got a, a PhD student, Maddie, um, who is conducting um, some interesting studies in Queensland uh, to help us better understand that interface between domestic and feral pigs. So specifically, um, uh, contact rates between feral and domestics um, to inform our representation of spillover. Now, I won't go into the technical highlights, uh, but you know that uh, that's just a, a grab uh, that it's uh, an original program um, based in Java. Uh, it uses a hybrid modeling approach, so we use a variety of different techniques. It's uh, very concurrent, has 30 to 40 uh, independent threads of execution, uh, which is our agent-based modeling approach. Runs on Windows, the Linux, or on the cloud. And then just very briefly, since uh, we started this 10 years ago, we've moved from FND to other contagious diseases. Uh, we do slow burning livestock disease, um, Mycoplasma bovis, uh, as an example. Uh, we do vector borne disease, both mechanical, biological vectors, wildlife reservoirs, invasive species, human disease. Got a bunch of postgraduates, um, lots of collaborations um, in different countries. And we have a European version of the model called EF from DIS. Uh, so we've got a tremendous, fantastic network um, of collaborators in this space, uh, which I'm very thankful to be part of. And um, you know, again, another shout out to the tribe. Uh, lots of people, lots of different backgrounds, and no one person could come up with a model um, such as this. It's very definitely a collaborative effort across a wide range of disciplines. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Dr. Bradhurst. Uh, just noting the, uh, oh, thank you. Everyone's giving quite a few claps. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, just even noticing uh, just some of the comments that have come through, but um, you know, data remains a key component to be able to make those informed decisions. And there's always gaps and opportunities to, to improve um, the, the quality of models. I'll, I'd just like to throw it out now to see whether anyone has any questions. I haven't seen any come through on the chat side, but um, you can also just uh, put your hand up if you've got any questions. We've got a couple of minutes um, if you would like. If there's any sort of burning, burning questions there. Don't be shy. Yeah. All right, here we go. Yin, go for it. Yeah, hello, Richard. Uh, thanks for the uh, great presentation. Uh, I have a question about the model. You said you do the simulation by select uh, uh, a farm to, to do the simulation. I just wonder, uh, I mean, in reality, uh, different uh, areas will face different risk. Uh, are you considering to improve the the modeling of, of this system by uh, doing the target seeding instead of just the, do the random seeding. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a good, very good question. So <clears throat> the model provides um, options on how you seed an infection. So you can specifically choose the primary case. Um, and you, you know that might be relevant if someone has a specific question about a specific type of outbreak in a specific area, specific time of year. But um, you can also do random seeding. So you can you can say I'm going to pepper infection in all, um, you know, say dairy, but yeah, not for ASF, but you know, all uh, certain small commercial in a certain part of the country, or a certain you know we could bring it in at a port. At a certain time of year, you know, when there's certain climactic conditions that may be a risk factor. So when the model doesn't 
try to tell you where it's going to arrive. So that would be a separate um, investigation looking at arrival pathways and levels of risk. But we can be informed by um, separate research into different arrival pathways, and then we can pepper infection anywhere in the country, um, <laughs> however, is, is, is uh, of interest to the user. OK, uh, can I ask another question? Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, uh, myself, I was while well, I was in China, I was involved in the emergency response and investigation to the Afri African swine fever outbreak in China. So uh, I see you are uh, considering the neighbor uh, infection as kind of a uh, transmission pathway. Uh, and based on my ob observation in the field, uh, some farms, even they are very close, like less than 20 meters away. The, the neighboring farm can be healthy for a long time, even after the stamping out. I just wonder how did you define the neighbor uh, farms in your uh, model? Thank you. Yeah, look, I've I've read stories like that where it it behaves differently something to something like FMD where it just it creeps in. Um, so, to be honest, our local spread pathway in ASF proves not to be that important. Um, First of all, it's a proximity based kernel. So if you, you know, you've got to have two neighboring pig farms within a certain distance for it to even qualify. And generally that's not the case. So practically it's not contributing a great deal to outbreaks. So, but we just provide it there as an option that a user can experiment with. So some of these things we don't really know. You know, we in invasive species and outbreaks, it's the unusual events, you know, the hitchhiking events, the sudden conveyance of a virus by a wild bird and it just appears. You don't generally prescribe that, but you provide the user an option that they can perturbate the system to see how we how we react if something a bit wacky happens and we get an outbreak just where we weren't expecting it at all. So it's a very good point that you've raised, and um, it's just there as a, as a tool. Yeah, thank you. Some excellent questions. Got about a minute to go. Um, yep, uh, Jeruni, go for it. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Can hear you loud and clear. Yes. Go for it. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Um, my name is Jar Zaroni Singh Snalamon. I've been working with the Department of Primary Industry um, in SA, South Australia. We really interested in applying your model. Um, then the question is, how can we really utilize it? So we should contact you directly to be involved in this, because it's like, and also it's um because you have a lot of input data to put in, and it's probably for us, we probably have to cater those data to be suitable for our state rather than you know because a lot of them i'm not really even though you're trying to explain where you get the data from but i think um the data for us probably going to be a little bit different so it will be better for us to really understand the input like data that you use and how we can tweak those like as a, if we want to apply it into our work so yeah. um is it better to contact you directly or how do we get involved in that thank you well, some good good points there. And look, the elephant in the room is the data-driven models. The Achilles heel is the data, of course. So, you know, a complex data-driven model hinges on having good data and having users that are familiar with the space so it can be parameterized and used appropriately. Um, but there are alternatives. If you don't have data, there's other modeling techniques which aren't so reliant on data, you know, more um, uh, mechanistic, uh, mathematical, or not mechanistic, they're more mathematical modeling approaches. So as far as um, I'm happy to be the first point of contact for the model and I can um, point you in the right direction, but the model is a, it's, it's not a commercial product. So it's, you know, the IP vest is a common one and it is available to users um, that sign a user agreement with the Commonwealth. So, you know, state governments, um, research institutions, etc. And um, 
as far as your specifics, then we need to take a closer look just to see what's what's sensible. Because I'm not going to give you this crazy complicated model that's just going to wear you down because you don't have the proper data or it's the wrong tool. But we can certainly help you, you know, with advice as to what's what's sensible. Thank you very much. Just checking to see if we've got any other questions. Noting the time, I, um, I'll i give you 10 more seconds if anyone wants to ask any more. Otherwise, I'm going to have to, to call it. I know you've probably got a lot more to, to ask, but um, no, I think that's it. Um, look, Dr. Bradhurst, thank you very much. And um, uh, on, on behalf of um, DAF and um, uh, everyone who's joined in today, it was an excellent presentation and um, it, it's always useful to have these sorts of um, presentations to show people not only how complex um, uh, the, the area is that we work in, but you know the challenges and the flexibility um, in the approaches that we need in maintaining a very strong national biosecurity system um, and it's uh, dependent on everyone in terms of you know on the research development implementation and um, the the roles that we can play pre and at the Australian border so um, it, I, I found it absolutely fascinating and, and thank you very much again for your time that was that was great um, this has been recorded thank you to everyone who um, yeah lots of claps going there for Dr Bradhurst thanks to everyone who um, attended um, just flagging that this is the last seminar for 2022. Uh, we'll, everyone will take a, a well-end break over Christmas before um, uh, we, we come back probably in around February or March next year. Um, sorry, I could just see there's one more hand up, Dr. Brad here. So um, I, I'm, I can't see the name, but uh, if you've got anything to add, go for it quickly. No, no that was just me trying to clap. <laughs> <laughs> Well done. Clapping, yeah. <laughs> Multiple claps. But thank you very much, Dr. Bradhurst. Really appreciate it. Thanks to you and Professor Robinson and the team. Uh, really enjoy working with Sever and the, the great work that you do. Thanks, everyone.